Guys, welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, joined by co-host Stacey Lee Turner. Hey, guys. And today we're lucky enough to have Rihanna, sorry, Rihanna, oh my God, I'll get there. Yeah, Rihanna Sanford via (laughs) Skype. I was going to say via Skype first and we've got Rihanna (laughs) joining us, but Rihanna, welcome. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you for having me, and I won't butcher your name. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start. Um, so to give you a bit more of a background, um, you, you've had quite the crazy life that we want to really dive into, but you, you've written two books. So the first one being The Identity of Purity, and then the second mm-hmm. one being The Special Life, so living with special needs and loving it. Um, mm-hmm. can, can you, before we dive too deep into what the books are about, could you actually just give us a bit of a background on yourself? Sure. So I like to start with the fact that I came from a very loving family. I mean, there was no doubt that our family loved each other. We um, were a family very strong in the faith. Um, It's Christian faith. And those are the things that I knew that were staples in our home. But unfortunately, I dealt with a lot of bullying in elementary school. I was just like skinnier than a rod. I got called bean pole, string bean, like every name in the book. I have this beautiful gap in my teeth that I never got fixed. So obviously I got used to it, but I got bullied for that big time back in the eighties. It was not cool. It's kind of cool so now. We've got, it's awesome. But kids are so mean, I mean, aren't they? Just... Oh, so mean. So mean. And it's all, it was always like the girls who seemed like they had something against me for some reason. But by the time um, I had gotten out of elementary school, my self-esteem was so low. Mm. It was, it was, I was so shy. I would kind of stand behind my mother just to be unseen just because I was treated so badly. I kind of had ta- had taken what was being said to me in school. I was kind of taking that as truth, even though my parents treated me lovingly, you know, it just, So that had a lot to do with the next several years in going, you know, being a teenager, I had to kind of figure out who I was and figure out what was true and what was not true. And that's kind of how I, you know, kind of stumbled to this more confident person that I am today. And I can smile real big with this big old space in between my teeth, which I know listeners can't see, but look me up, you'll see it. Um, and and I there have been a lot of like major life altering types of things that have made me come to the place. You know, some people like to call it like come to Jesus moment or whatever, like just come to terms with who I am, you know, who I am, who am I according to who my creator made me to be? And then, you know, what am I going to do with that knowledge? Am I just going to sit back in the cut and, you know, not do a whole lot of stuff with it? Or am I going to help and really be... Um, you know, give and contribute to society. So I've gotten to this point now where I really enjoy just inspiring people to become the best versions of themselves, whether that's health, whether that's spiritual, um, whether that's in mommyhood. It does, it's just like in so many different areas to just to really help inspire people to be better. That's awesome. And what would you say your title is if you had one? Would you say like life coach or health coach or any words that kind of connect for you or you rather not label it just I call myself a healthy lifestyler a healthy lifestyler because I think that we don't put enough um we don't put enough like yes everyone thinks of health as in like what you eat and what you do you know working out and stuff like that but I think mental illness is an issue today because we have not concentrated on what it takes to be healthy in your mind. Mm. Um, And so I think healthy lifestyle are all around, you know, spiritually, like we all are spiritual beings, I believe, and that when we are able to focus on becoming better, even in a spiritual sense, um, we're better, you know, we're healthier that way too. So a healthy lifestyler is kind of, if I had to put a title on it, that would be it. Yeah, awesome, I love it. Yeah, and you talk about faith, uh, so obviously, you said you came from a Christianity background, but like you just said, it's spiritual in regards to like, if the listener is not religious, they don't have to be religious. They can just be finding yeah. their own spiritual background. So, I mean, whenever you mention your faith, it could just be whatever yeah. their faith to them is. So, I mean, yeah, for the listeners, it's a, it's a good way to kind of decipher it. Like, hey, if, if Rihanna does talk about God, then it's just talking about your higher being for today. Um, right. But, sure. I mean, something... Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Something that no, we... I said absolutely. 
Ah, cool. Yeah, something that we really focus on is uh, the seven pillars of health for us. And so with this, it's talking about not just nutrition or not just exercise because there's a, a whole heap more that come into that comes into health. And um, right. it doesn't just happen from those two things. You need to look at the, the greater part of life, like what else is happening around you. And one of the big things we dive into is mindset, which is really cool. It's where we're aligning a lot um, with what we're talking about today. And I guess going into your two books, the first one, The Identity of Purity, this really came mm-hmm. to you and I can hear it no i can kind of see it now because of your background story but it's about helping teenage girls to find themselves right yeah and find not just yes themselves in a divine perspective because again kind of going with the reason why you were created you Mm. know what is the reason why you were created because if you really can come into tune with that as you make decisions and as you you know, kind of seek out the things that are for you in this life, you're not, you're going to treat yourself a certain kind of way. First of all, you're going to hold your head up a certain way. You're not going to allow, secondly, you're not going to allow people to trash you. Mm. You're not going to allow people to abuse you because you know who you are, you know what you were called to. And so you have this different kind of mindset where your decisions, your choices, your opinions are kind of funneling into that truth, that truth of what you were created for, what your purpose is, and everything else can kind of just fall to the wayside. It's like, you know, like just brush off everything else because it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you can take everything else with a grain of salt if it doesn't line up with the identity of who you truly are. That's awesome. And that can be really challenging for some people to do. Hey, like if you, if they've never gone down that path before of of looking more deeply, they kind of get pushed into a life where, you know, their work dictates what they do or their family dictates what they do and not in an abusive manner, but just in a way where they haven't taken the time, created that space for themselves to sit down and figure that stuff out for themselves. So what's the first port of call that you take people on when you're helping them to discover what their higher purpose is? I And I think... It can be different things for different people. For me, for example, um, I stumbled into singing. I stumbled into singing and I realized how much I enjoyed that and how much joy that gave me. And I realized that was something I was good at. So, you know, start out with finding those things that you have strengths in, those things that you enjoy Find the right kind of people even that give you joy and that kind of boosts you up a little bit. You kind of get energy from. I think that's kind of something that you can do to help, first of all, help. There's obviously the general things. You know, again, I'm a believer. And so that means I take a lot of the scripture from the Bible. And so there's a lot of scripture in there that says you are more than an overcomer. You know, Mm -hmm. that you are victorious no matter what. Like take some of those things to truth. Because if you're told that, when someone treats you otherwise, you're able to like, wait, no, that's not true. You know, yeah. I choose to believe this about myself. And so some of those things is really basic, you know, just choosing to believe what God says about you first or whatever, like you said, whatever it is that you believe in your heart of hearts is true. Decide to take that truth in, you know, yeah. at 100 percent and don't let anybody talk you out of it. So but then the other things is just, you know, when it comes to purpose and value and stuff like that, because you kind of have to make a decision that as you go through your life and you're going through college, you're choosing careers and things like that, that you don't compromise on the things that, you know, make you you mm-hmm. just because of what's popular or just because dad said you should do this. Like I looked at my mom, my mother was making bank, y'all. She was making six figures climb in corporate America and she has the same skills that I have. So I'm looking at her saying that that's what I'm going to do. Like (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to climb that corporate America just like she did and make six figures. I thought that was my purpose just because I looked at what my mom did and was successful at. She did it. I could do it too. Right. Mm -mm. that's not, that's not what was in store for me at all. And I had to kind of stumble through that a little bit when I got this little girl of mine, that's when I realized, no, there's no way I'm climbing any corporate America, you know, with the needs of a special needs daughter, you know, with all of that stuff that came with it. So, Mm, and that kind of leads into the second book, but I think, um, we might, we might get to it eventually because there's a few more things I want to dive into in regards to identity of purity and like, there's that stage, uh, I think, where people can really build themselves up 
uh, when they're by themselves. Like, hey, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to do this. This is going to be a really great day. And then they go out to face the world, and then that's when it crumbles yeah. back down. They get knocked back down. Exactly. Home. So how do you how do you work in with people like that? Like, if you can't be there to hold their hand and really say, hey, it's all right. Like when they have that moment of, oh Jesus, like this is not going to work for me right yeah. now. Yeah. Like, yeah. How do you how do you push those people through those moments? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm a big believer in not not thinking about just what's happening right now. Like most things that are happening right now are only temporary. Mm -hmm. Right. So first of all, just dial it down a little bit, you know, (laughs) because think about it in the big perspective. So that's what I'm thinking of. I'm saying like the big perspective is what, you know, this is what's happening right now, but I can bet you this is not going to be an issue that you're going to be dealing with. That's going to be a long lasting type of thing. In most cases, that's the case. Yeah. But another, when it comes to your mindset, I'm a huge believer in, in um, affirmations, Yeah, affirmations. And it kind of goes back to the truth, like believing those statements and those things and having those be a constant in your mind. And so I actually do affirmations on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day on a really rough day. I'm like, I need to do these things again because it's telling my subconscious mind what to think. Mm -hmm. And if I know that my subconscious mind is really what controls my opinions, my beliefs, my decisions, then that's what I need to really feed. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, making sure that I'm telling myself that, Um, like when it comes to my smile, like I have one that says I have a warm and radiant smile. You totally do. Oh, I love it. I love the time now, you know, and, and so you tell yourself those things so that again, when someone or something happens that kind of trips you up a bit, you have that information in your mind and your subconscious mind that can come back and fight against those kind of hard, rough times. Um, and again, kind of go back to whatever is at the heart of who you are spiritually, because that has carried me a long ways because I realized that this, everything is not wrapped around me. Like there's something that's so much bigger than me out there. Mm -hmm. And when I can like correctly, um, put things in line according to, okay, well, this is might be happening right now, but what might be happening through me, you know, as a result of this kind of crappy thing happening right now. You know, how can I flip this around? How can this be flipped around for good? And there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about um, all things working together, all things. It doesn't say some things, you know, it says all things can work together for my good. So I choose, okay, well, I'm going to just believe that because I don't like to believe anything less than that right now, the way things are looking. So, so, so it's a number of things. It's at, you know, what do you choose to say to yourself and what do you allow yourself to think on a normal basis? Those thoughts are, what are they like? There's 50,000 thoughts a day, you know, that go through your mind. What kinds of thoughts are those? Mm -hmm. Are they positive thoughts? Are they negative thoughts? Are they you know, what are they, are they thoughts that are feeding, you know, your future or are you stealing from yourself by deciding to dwell on negativity? Yeah. I love that. There's a couple of things you said there that really hit home for me. One was around perspective. So kind of putting things into what's important in the overarching theme of everything. And also how you said about things being very, um, transitory, like you know, the thought that came to mind when you said like, this won't be like this forever, like the now is not forever, is right. this this too shall pass. Like, right. you know, it exactly. feels horrible right now and yeah. tomorrow will be a better day and you can use the affirmations to kind of get to that place. Yeah, it's awesome. kind of, anytime you look back on any failure you've ever had in life, it's always turned out to be better. Like, yeah, you or find for the better. You, exactly, there's always something better from it. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I've just finished, like literally just finished uh, listening to a book called The Tools and I was listening to it on the way home. Have you heard of it before? Uh, it doesn't ring a bell no, no. It's It's really quite cool but something that, that I was talking about was literally very similar to what you were saying about like... Um, I guess giving yourself to faith to some extent, but they're not, they weren't saying faith as in religion. They were saying faith as in a higher being. Like you, you have to use these tools, but you have to believe that something else is going to help guide you through it. And until you do do those things, um, it doesn't necessarily always work out. But a few of the tools that they use are actually thinking of yourself in the most embarrassing form that you have of yourself. Like that, that self. Like a memory exactly. or an imaginated one. Like both. 
like a, a memory or imagination of yourself at that point in time when you were probably most embarrassed of yourself. Like you look back at yourself and you're like, oh, that was the time where I was probably most like skittish and scared or whatever it might be in your life. And they say that you have to envision that and actually invite it to come to everything that you go to. Because if you push it back and say like, no, don't, don't that's, that's the me that I want no one to see, mm, it's actually, mm-hmm. it's creating that embarrassment and causing that embarrassment and then it creates like long-term issues. So what you need to do is envision that, invite it to come with you and then offer up love for for it but also everyone in the room and saying like, no, it's all right. Like I can be that person and everyone's going to love me. I can be the person I am right now and everyone's going to love me. It's just about actually having the confidence to show everyone and that's the biggest thing. We go out and like people might go to a party and they put on this face and they put on this act and it's it's not them. Like they're completely different to who they usually are. It's like, why not show Mm -hmm. your true colors? Like what's stopping you from showing your true colors like you know what people will probably like you better if you do show your true colors because you're not faking it you're exactly just authenticity is amazing your true self yeah and it's not as exhausting yeah. either when you put on a face you have to drain your you know internal stores of energy and happiness for that yeah and i think it's not only exhausting to be somebody that you're not but i think it's exhausting to be constantly dodging who you're supposed to be mm. like and I think because a lot of people are fearful of maybe challenging themselves or walking into, you know, this thing. Cause I think, I think most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we know there are big things that we could be doing mm. and, but we're too fearful of, of failing to do it or what that might ask of us or, you know, stepping out of something that's not familiar or that's not comfortable for us. And so I think that that's exhausting by constantly dodging, you know, those, those calls, those, those purposes, those big things that we should be doing, but because we're so fearful of what that, what that means that's exhausting mm. yeah, you know definitely definitely and and then when you do honor your true self you're more able to put the energy into the things that do allow you to make change to be happier mm-hmm. and be the best version of yourself so it's kind of like seeing the wood from the trees hey it's like this mm-hmm. thing is draining me once i can top up my energy and move away from this i can actually start to make progress in the direction that i'm looking to yeah that's really cool well and i i like that um what you were saying maddie about um like n- not ignoring the things about you from the past or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, it's impossible to get anywhere without dealing with whatever happened to you in the past. And yeah, you definitely. have to realize that that's a part of you. Like that helps you to make you who you are today. Mm-hmm. And, and even going one step further than that, if you're able to take those things, okay, take those things that were kind of upsetting or difficult or embarrassing, like you said, and actually have constructive criticism to see where are the things where I'm needing to grow, Mm -hmm. you know, where are the areas in my life that I know I could stand to improve. That's just called being humble, first of all. And, And that's a characteristic trait that is lacking big time in humanity, period. Um, why is it so hard for us to look in the mirror and pick out the things that may not be strengths or the weaknesses in our lives or in our character? Why is it so hard for us to look at look at those things and say, okay, this is something I need to get better at mm-hmm. and put forth your best foot forward to making you know, it strides to improve mm-hmm. those things about yourself. Yeah. You know. And I guess to build on that, you know, it's not looking at them to say, because I'm a bad person, it's more looking at them to have acceptance and maybe even forgiveness to yourself for beating yourself up about them and then looking and saying, well, now I'm aware of what's going on. How can I shift it? How can I make changes to make these strengths rather than feeling like they are weaknesses? Yeah, it's with gratitude. You know, you you have gratitude for the ability to see those things so that they can be changed so that you can contribute to somebody. Even just think about somebody that you love, you Mm -hmm. know, the closest person to you. Like I think, and that was kind of how I got to where I am health wise is because I'm like, I ain't doing nothing to take care of me. And that's no good because what happens to this girl who needs me to do everything for her? If 
if my health goes down the drain, I have got to change something. Yeah. And like being willing to say that about yourself is a huge, huge step, I think, in becoming a better human, you mm-hmm. know, if you can just be that humble mm-hmm. and, yeah. and be thankful. Like, I'm thankful now. I look back and I'm like, so thankful. Yes, I used to hoard Oreos in my nightstand and make sure that I had little Debbie available at my, you know, whenever I wanted it. But, you know, it's like, I'm thankful now that I could see that that was not good for me so or my family. Like, yeah. they were getting much lesser you know, version of me, um, that I was able to improve it. It's actually, it's actually an obstacle that we come across with a lot of mothers just in general, because they put everyone else first and then they eventually work themselves down and they get ground down to the ground when they literally just, uh, they put on weight. They, they don't become like, they, they lose their mental state. They start to get upset there, but everything that they stand for is their family. So they just keep pushing for that. And it's not until yeah. they, they realize that when they get back to that healthy state, hey, I'm going to be feeling better. I'm going to be doing more for me. So therefore, I'm able to give more for my family. Um, but it, it's quite quite a big thing to to overcome, I think, to start with for them to actually get an understanding of it. Like, oh, hold up. No, that is a better thing for, for me and my family to be doing. Mm. And it can Absolutely. be that driver. Like you say, that, that higher purpose for some people is is motherhood and that mm-hmm. that drives them to then make better choices and anytime they're faced with, you know, should I eat the Oreos or should I have something else yeah. kind of thing? Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing. You bring up a, yeah, you bring up a good point about that, you know, with motherhood and that's something I know this is probably not going to be a very loved thought, but this is something that I have run into with a lot of friends, a lot of, a lot of people like when we were ministering. Um, when your kids leave the house, they go off to college or something. And I, what we run up against in the ministry is we rep, we run up against these poor moms who have lost all manner of meaning because their kids have left. Mm. So while yes, it's important that you, you know, or it's a, it's a funky balance. You have to make sure that you realize that you are valuable enough to make choices for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that you can be a better version to give to your children. Yes, but you, it has to start with you knowing your own self value because your children ain't gonna always be there. Those kids are going to go off and make their own kids. You know, <laughs> they're gonna go off, and you may not, you know, have touch with them even very well. And so you have to make sure that you know that you're that you're while. And it's like it's just, it's a weird way of being selfish. You know, it's a weird way of being selfish and and I am not a selfish person at all, but I know that I have to look at me being worth it, you know, first before Mm. I just say, oh, I'm going to do everything for my kids. Like I'm, I kind of had to move away. I like here, remember hearing that even before I became an adult and I thought that it was a cool thing. Like I do everything for my kids, you know, everything for my babies. I'll do everything for my babies. And while that's all, it sounds really good, but what happens when those babies aren't there? Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. you have to then learn how to be valuable for you. You yeah. know, yeah. that's super valuable. And I think like uh, you talk about being selfish, but it's also selfless. Like to be able to do that for for your like you're actually making yourself stronger for everyone else around you. So it's not necessarily mm-hmm. selfish. It's doing it in the act to make everyone else better as well. Well, I like I've, I work with a meditation teacher, and and she says you know it's reframing or re defining what the word means like selfish has been given negative connotations but what if we redefine the word selfish and go it's actually not a bad thing to be selfish because of all the reasons we just talked about it's actually a really positive thing Mm -hmm. to have that selfishness and and if you want to use a different word self-care or self-love can easily go in place of selfish absolutely but it's such a positive thing yeah. Um, and I mean, like talking back to once again, identity of purity, I, I would say like right now I love myself and I have loved myself for a long time, but I know in my life, there was times in my life where I would look in the mirror and say, I don't love myself. And so that's a big thing, right? And for a teenager or for anyone who's in that point, like I don't remember how I changed that around. I know my confidence built. Mm-hmm. I know that everything else changed, but I don't, I don't remember for me, like for me, it was, I guess, growing. Um, and going and doing 
extra extra outside of what I was already doing that, that changed me from being that person that didn't like myself or didn't love myself more so to being that person that does. And I, I strongly say to myself, hey, I, I love you. like, And I'm happy to say that. I'm happy to say it aloud. But it's like, mm-hmm. how do you then get someone or like what, what tips do you give, uh, I guess, for people to be able to spin that? Yeah. And so it, it can be progressive. Like you just said, you know, Maddie, like it just kind of happened along, you know, as you kind of grew or whatever. Um, but it goes back for me, for me, and this is kind of where I have coached or whatever. It goes back to this, this foundational thing that you believe in, you know, and again, going back to the Bible, because that's, that's foundational for me, but it, it tells me that I was beautifully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. You know, it tells me that in scripture that I am beautifully and wonderfully made that even before the earth was founded, that I was a thought in God's mind. This is the creator of the universe, the stars, the moons, the heavens, like all of that. And so that, that really helped me in my mindset. Well, goodness gracious, if the creator of everything that has life thought of me, you know, and made me specifically the way that I am, who am I to spit on that? Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm made specifically the way I am. There is no one like me in the whole world. No one has this gap. You know, no one has, no one has the little hair on my knuckles. Just like I, you know, it's like all these little imperfections about who I am. You just embrace it. Because the second that you are able to embrace it, you will be happier. There will be so much of pressure and load taken off of your shoulders because you finally are embracing who you are. In, yeah. A in, unique snowflake. <laughs> yes. And I, and I have this phrase that I like to share with people that, um, that you are uniquely you. No one compares to you and no one can do what you do like you. And it's so true. And I think that we just have to know that that is, you know, that we weren't supposed to be made to compare each other against. We weren't supposed to be cookie cutter versions of humans. We were supposed to be unique in every way. I mean, look at all of the DNA and how DNA is so complex. And you have this gene or this gene or that gene or this gene. We're going to be different. Even twins have differences in their DNA, right? So it's like, just embrace those things about you that make you you. That's step number one, you know, embrace those things. First of all, knowing that you were made to be different. You were made specifically for a reason because everybody can't do the same things. Everybody can't say things like you say it, Matthias, right? Isn't, now I might butcher your name, Matthias. Yeah, that's right, Matthias. Matthias. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, no, even. Everybody doesn't have a smile like you, Stacey. It's just like we were made to be unique. And so I'll always take those things and those differences and those opinions, those likes, those dislikes, and just and, and, and own them. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like a popular phrase, own them. Yeah. Um, and no matter what, no matter good, bad, or indifferent, no matter what, this is the life that you've been given to live. So own it, embrace it, live the heck out of it, right? Like just do do the best, do the biggest, do the best, do the bravest, like all of it that you can mm-hmm. because you're going to be the most fulfilled if you do. Otherwise, it's going to be exhausting like what we were talking about earlier, Stacey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, like a lot of that really comes back to gratitude for me. Like you you learn to say, well, this is me, so what can I be grateful for? Hell, I'm, I'm exactly. grateful for my gap. Hell, I'm grateful for my hairy knuckles. Like these are things that I'm happy to have <laughs> and it's like – you, you own it exactly, but I think it needs to start um, potentially at a smaller level, and that's why gratitude is so prevalent and becoming more prevalent for so many people. It's like, what is your daily gratitude practice? Do you have one? If you don't, let's start. Yeah. How do we start? Yeah, <laughs> like maybe you'd be thankful for having clean running water. Maybe you'd be thankful for food. Maybe you'd be thankful for having a car. Like if you've got a roof over your head, maybe you'd be thankful for that. If you woke up today, maybe you'd be thankful for that. Like <laughs> that's it, massive. <laughs> it, exactly. Like there's a lot of things that can can be like we just take it for granted, really, in day to day life because it's just around yeah. us. So. So there's a couple of things. Really Maddie said um, about like, being able to look in the mirror and say I love you, and a lot of people hear that and. I, I don't know about the States. I, I know it's definitely more supportive in the States, but here in Australia, there's this thing called tall poppy syndrome. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard yeah, of it. You're going to have to define that for okay, me. Okay, no worries. So, <laughs> so what happens is if you're um, 
confident or if you're doing well or if you're happy with your life and how you are, like you're able to look in the mirror and say, I love you. There's a lot of people that would instantly go to kind of a, a how dare you and try and cut you down because you're able to stand in your power and live your truth and mm -hmm. be happy. And it's not, I don't think mm -hmm. it's as popular in the circles that we surround ourselves in because we, we like to, um, I guess, be the best version of ourselves and yeah, surround ourselves absolutely. with the average of the five people that we want to be like. Um, yeah. But it's something that we do come across with a lot of our members and helping them to let go of other people's stories so that they can create their mm -hmm. own. But it's hard mm -hmm. when you're coming up against what people say are jokes when they try mm -hmm. to like make a, make a funny at your expense but really it cuts you deep because it is an attempt to knock you down because they feel bad about themselves because they're not able right. to do the things you're doing. And it's definitely more of an Australian issue than it is uh, mm. for you guys in the States. But um, mm -hmm. it's something that we're very conscious of and also like trying to help people out of that. And we're not saying that, you know, in the States you guys don't have similar thoughts well, it's to like what adult people bullying, have. Right? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a kind of a form of adult bullying. There's not as much of a supportive environment for people when they're trying to make this transition. Yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's more like the bullying, how bullying comes out in children and mm -hmm. teenagers, but in adults, you know what I think about that? It, it's when you're strolling on Facebook and you, cause I know I've done it or I'm guilty. I'm guilty of it. If I see somebody who intimidates me or I see them making moves or something like that, there's this little smidgen of, uh, yeah. You just want to grunt or something at them because you feel almost convicted, mm. you know, that that maybe you're you're not doing the exact, you know, the best that you can be doing. Maybe you're not affecting that many lives or maybe you're not maybe you know that you're not where you should be in life. And when you look at somebody else on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you immediately go to that comparison place and it makes you feel really really, ugh, you know, like this big but you kind of like scoff at them for them being great. So that's what I think of that's the similarity to what Definitely. you're talking about. But it's more silent for adults. Like we won't go and talk and talk about it to people. Like how dare you go out there and be doing all <laughs> things like yeah. that. Like, like should you say – now I've heard of um, some in my circle, sometimes family members, we call them Archie Bunkers. Do you do you guys have the show All in the Family? Do you remember it was like really old uh, old I've, I've show. heard of it. I've never seen it though. Okay, with Carol Connor, I think is his name and um but he had his his character is Archie Bunker and he was all his wife's name is Edith and he's always just barking at her. Like just telling like treating her like she's just so dumb and so like little very little value or whatever and so I like to kind of call those people like that that might be in your lives they might be closer to you like a like a sister or a brother or a family member or something like that who might look and see that see what you're doing and they're kind of barking at you they still are treating you like the little you know such and such that they knew mm -hmm. of you back before you were doing all these big things or whatever and they're kind of scoffing at you, you know, kind of like trying to put you back in your place. Like I knew you when you were such and such. So that's, I see some of that more with people who like even maybe husbands or something that may be looking at their wives who are trying to start their own businesses from home so they can be home with their babies and they're looking down on them. They're kind of being like Archie bunkers. So sometimes we do see some of those types of things. We don't have the term for it. Like, like whatever that term. <laughs> oh, puppy. Tall poppy. Yeah, tall poppy tall syndrome. Poppy. It, like T A L L. Like when somebody's taller tall than everybody tall. else. Yeah, it's just my accent. Tall sorry. Poppy. Okay. <laughs> tall, tall poppy. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, we kind of call them Archie Bunkers here, mm. or um, just just people who are just downright yeah. um, jealous of you winning. You I know. think it kind of goes back to exactly what you were saying before about we have like what 50,000 thoughts roughly a day and it's like mm. if you are judging someone that's a negative thought and then what are, what else negative that's coming into your head like yeah. have a judgment detox ex <laughs> oh, yeah judgment but mm. even negativity like if it's always there then of course you're going to have a negative mindset like of course you can slide into a negative way if it's always there like how do you change it around and if you catch yourself and pull yourself back to reality when you're doing those things then it, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to get out of that negative thinking Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, yeah. positive do beget positives, just like negatives beget negatives. So if you're thinking negative yeah. all the time, negative shit's going to happen. It's like if you watch yeah. news of the morning, 
you're more mm-hmm. likely going to have a bad day. Whereas if you hop up and do some gratitude or just have a fun, happy morning, you're more than likely yeah. going to have a good day. Like it's just, it yeah. comes down to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's and being intentional. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. It's being intention. So um, within saying that, I want to actually transition to your second book, which comes mm-hmm. with what you were talking about before with um, you, you've got a daughter with special needs. Can you dive a little mm-hmm. deeper into like, I guess her journey so far? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, our very first girl, our very first daughter, our very first, I shouldn't say girl or daughter, child, um, we were new parents and I had a fairly regular pregnancy with her. Didn't really, I mean, I kind of went into a little bit of preterm stuff, but I didn't have her till 38 weeks. So, um, we weren't expecting anything to be different or off with, with this child. And she kind of started off developing normal, you know, um, sat up on her own. She held her head up on her own like early. And so we're just kind of enjoying the life of being parents, you know, brand new parents with this gorgeous baby girl. And she even started to like say things like mama and papa and she'd say ink for drink. And, you know, she, she was just a joy and she really still is, but she just was like every parent's dream of the perfect child. Literally. She hardly ever cried. We, we literally hardly ever heard that girl cry. And then by the time she was about nine months old, she started to lose her words. We just noticed my husband and I both noticed that she wasn't speaking as much. And then her, her, um, her, her hand motions just got to be really uncoordinated, almost kind of like what you'd see if someone had Parkinson's or something like that. Um, and she would start getting clumsy, like just dropping her toys or a sippy cup, stuff like that. And so by the time she was, you know, 12 months old, we were like, we've got to go see a specialist because this, this is not normal. And, and up until then, like the doctors were saying, you know, Oh, you know, she'll, probably grow out of it or it's, you know, she'll crawl when she's ready or, you know, it's normal. Um, and so we were finally got to the point where we're like, we're going to go get a second opinion, you know? And it was fast forward over the next couple of years, two and a half years to be exact before we finally got a diagnosis of Rett syndrome. And so I do know that there is a Rett syndrome organization in Australia, um, because literally this is a neurological disorder that can affect any girl. Usually it's girls, um, because it's the gene that mutates is on the Y or the X chromosome. Um, so it's almost exclusively only seen in girls, but, um, we finally got that diagnosis and I will tell you, there was a lot of relief there for me because I was thinking, Oh, I ate too many little Debbie's or I ate, you know, I didn't drink enough water or I didn't exercise (laughs) enough. Like I was, you know, mom guilt is so, Oh, it's so toxic, but we almost, you know, always just go to blaming ourselves for stuff because mom thinks that we're, we're supposed to do everything right. And we're supposed to nourish, you know, the kids and nurture and, you know, fix everything. And so, um, so anyway, I, we got that diagnosis. It was a big weight off my shoulders realizing that I did not cause this to happen. And that was just a spontaneous mutation of a gene. And that began our road of needing to do what you just talked about, Maddie, needing to make a decision to be positive. Because at that point, we realized they're telling us there's no cure for this disease and that she may need 24-7 care all of her life. Yeah. And you're a brand new parent and we weren't brand new at that point. We'd already had, by that, by that diagnosis, we had already had the other, another child, but that's not something when you're younger in parenthood that you want to hear, you know, no one, no one ever grows up. And when they're a kid and they imagine themselves being a mom or a dad, no one ever is imagining them pushing a wheelchair, you know? Um, so there were lots of fears. There were lots of doubts that we really could have made a decision to dwell on. I'm not saying that we didn't think about them. I'm not saying that they didn't come, but we had to make conscious repetitive decisions to not dwell on them. Mm -hmm. And it literally had to be an everyday thing. And so sometimes people look at me and they say, how are you so positive? How are you able to have so much joy and I start had to start that very young. She's 14 years old now. Yeah. So I always tell people, like, 
it didn't happen overnight, but we had to be practicing this as a habit on a daily basis to wake up in the morning and make a decision and say, okay, no matter what, we are going to be thankful. We're going to see the good in everything. You know, we're just going to decide to see the silver lining and, you know, believe God's got our back regardless of what we see. And that's just, we kind of had to make it a culture, you know, make it a thing that, that was how our family, we were going to have joy in our house. We were going to have peace in our house. We were determined Mm -hmm. that, you know, we weren't going to look at our baby girl and be resentful. Yeah. Yeah. Like, That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It really is like seeing it as a blessing rather than a curse. And the hard thing is that so many people wouldn't look at it that way and they would say, well, like, because you're of faith, it might be like, well, why, God, why did you give us this? Um, mm-hmm. Rather than saying, like, okay, so how do we deal with it and how can we move mm-hmm. forward with with the mm-hmm. situation? And still find joy and happiness. Exactly. Which you've um, done successfully. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's a huge thing. I have to say, though, if you, if she's in the other room, but like, all I have to do is show you a picture of that girl smiling from ear to ear. And joy is very easy to be found. Yeah. So she radiates joy. And she most radiates. people with disabilities really are like that. Like, I've got a yeah. cousin who's Down syndrome, and she, she yeah. brightens up everyone's life. Like, you go and you, oh, you spend yeah. a day with Caitlin, and it's just like the best day. You're always smiling and yeah. happy when you leave. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're so honest and so authentic, really, in everything that they do. Like, they mm-hmm. don't have the filter that everyone else has, which is great. They don't. Yeah. yeah, they don't. They see life through so – it's such an untoxic lens, you know. Like, they just have such a different way of seeing the world. Mm. And it's – like, it's sometimes I wish, you know. Like, I could see the world through her eyes. And what a gift, you know. How blessed is she? That she has the ability to see so much good, you know, and like you said, like the filter, like she, she's tough. Like she's been through surgery after surgery. She's been through hospital visit after hospital visit, sickness after sickness. And the girl can still light up the room with a smile because she has the most truest definition of what joy is possible, you know, just oozing out of her. So that's amazing. And, and we can learn so much from her, right? Like we do Absolutely. overcomplicate things. Why don't we yeah. bring it back to what's important? What's simple? What's straightforward? Like what, what is the thing that we should be focusing on right now, rather than all the crazy noise that surrounds us with, you know, the internet and, and everything else that's happening. It's like, just bring right. it back to love and to joy and just be here in the moment. And that's, that's powerful. And stuff. that's, that's part of why I wrote that book. Um, this special life living with special needs and loving it. Because there are so many things about this life that I would have never learned or or stumbled upon were it not for the birth of my daughter being exactly the way that she is. And so it's, it's helping people to have that enlightened perspective, that more positive perspective, that this life isn't as crappy as you might think it is. And when people, when I tell people and I say, and I know it, it's very, I mean, I've had the fears. I've had the doubts. So I understand why people would say, oh, I'm sorry. Like when I tell them I have a daughter who can't walk and can't talk. And usually that's the response. People say, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, don't be. I'm like, I got the best life here. Like I've learned so much as a result of her being the way that she is. Like, don't be. You probably would like to be in my shoes as a matter (laughs) of fact. You know, like, and that's literally the what I feel through and through. I, I believe that through and through that my life would not be the same. It would not nearly be as enriched. Mm. I would not nearly have as much knowledge. I feel like that I have about purpose and identity and all those things that I've walked through as a result of her being the way that she is. So I'm, so I wanted to help other moms that are in my shoes to get rid of the bitterness to get to not allow the anger and the hurt and the doubt and the grief and all those things to overwhelm them so much to the point that they miss out on all the good and all the blessings and all you know that life has to offer second that you don't make excuses for the things that you can conquer in this world because you have a child with special needs a lot of times we, especially kind of going back to mom guilt, we feel like we have to just take care of our kid. You know, like there's nothing else that, that we should be able to do other than take care of our kid. 
But it's like, if that's the case, if God knew that from the beginning I was going to have this child with all these needs, then why did he give me a voice to sing? Why did he give me a passion to want to help people? Why didn't he give me the ability to write? I didn't ask to write. I didn't. I didn't never, I never wanted to write a book, y'all. That was never in my plan. But apparently, there was something that needed to get to other people. So here I am now with the ability to write. And so I have not said no to all the things that I could have said no to just because I'm thinking I have to just be Kaya's mom, yeah. you know. Um, and so part of the fulfilling and the loving your life goes back to the embracing your life, embrace this thing, like fully embrace it so that the things that you have to experience and the things that, you know, are here for you to enjoy and to, um, walk through, you will be able to, because you've taken the blinders off of your eyes. You know, you're not quite so narrow minded and narrow Mm -hmm. focus. You've allowed yourself to see the whole world. Yeah. That is at your fingertips, even in spite of the fact that you have this kid with severe special needs. Yeah. So I really wanted to make that aware and available for for other moms in my shoes. I just my heart just became broken, you know, mm-hmm. after being in so many special needs moms groups and Rett syndrome mom groups and things like that, where it's just like it can be so depressing. You know, just reading through the comments and stuff, it's just very woe is me in a lot of cases. And I realize yeah. these moms are venting they're just venting you know and I understand that we all need to be able to vent but I'm like these women need to know (laughs) they need to know that they are not you know like their lives have not come to an end like they can be the best dang mom of that child possible if they just had an enlightened perspective about this amazing life you know And, and so has there been a big aftermath since writing the book or since launching the book have you had a lot of people come back to you and just be like oh well thank you you've completely changed my perspective I have had several, there has been, there have been some that have come, like there's been some special needs camps that I've just, I usually go and find special needs camps and I'll try to figure out ways to just give the books away, yeah. you know? And I, well, it was one mom, I was getting ready to give it to her and she's like, I already have it. I already read it. I love it. She's <laughs> like, it, it was so helpful for me. And so that always just kind of makes my heart jump because that's the whole purpose. You know, I, spent three and a half months writing it and, and trying to market and whatnot for even if it was for that one mom. But, um, but yeah, there's been several different ones in different places, different venues. I'm trying to figure out different ways to get it in more hands. Um, I've had the thought to go up to a hospital and just start passing them out, you know, to some of the, um, on the, you know, at Children's Mercy here in the Kansas City area, just because for me, the message is so important you know, just to help with that. Cause I just feel like that if, again, going back to me, just wanting to inspire people to become better versions of themselves, you become a better version of yourself when you are living this life that you were made to live. And I mean like living it, not just like existing, you know, in the life, but I mean like really living the heck out of this life, you know, um, and you will be better for it and you will be able to affect other people because of it. And I'm just like my tagline for my business, whatever you want to call it is be inspired, inspire another repeat. Okay. Yeah. So like be inspired, inspire another repeat, like just let that cycle keep going, you know, keep finding ways for you to be inspired so you can inspire another and then be inspired again, <laughs> inspire another It's like just, it's a great cycle because then we're all, we're all giving and we're all you know, improving ourselves. And so I just wanted to really make sure that that was something that can be shared and passed on so that it, it's something that the whole community of special needs moms, you know, will be able to help each other with. That's awesome. And you specifically mentioned that you wanted to share that story with people who are in the same shoes as you, but I feel like everyone can be inspired by your perspective and, and your story because, you know, like if, if you're being guided to live this life that you're living and you have the challenges that you have, then like we're not saying it's easy, but you've chosen to make it the best life possible. Then yeah. anyone can, can Get make the shift. The Do you know what yeah, I mean? Like, exactly. yeah. Yeah, like anyone should be able yeah. to be, follow that tagline, be inspired by what you're doing, whether they have a special needs child or not. Or not. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's almost like the more, um, how do I word this? Like sometimes the easier someone's life is like relative, adversity you know everyone's got their challenges in their own life and it's relative to their own perspective but when you then 
not the women to compare because we spoke about that before, but when you look at people like yourself who do have like bigger challenges in life and you're still seeing the positives, like that person mm -hmm. needs to kind of tone it down a little bit and go like, I'm so privileged. Like I am so yeah. lucky to have the issue where my life is, is not easy, but like in that state where I get to choose what my purpose is. Like I get to figure this stuff out. You know, there's people that right. their basic purpose in Africa is like making sure that they get water to their people. Oh, like, yeah. every day. Right. goes back to the gratitude thing. Right. And so, um, yeah, and you're right. I had a gal who texted me the other day who got their hands on my book. She does not have children with special needs. She doesn't even have young children or her children are grown and out of the house, but it helped her because no one has a perfect life. We, none of us have it all together. We all have some kind of adversity that either we have gone through, we are going through, or we will go through. Yeah. And for every single one of us, every single one of those messages that I put in that book, that it's only temporary, you know, like there's, there's eternity and there's now, and this is just temporary. Okay. And then believing who you are, like taking the truth of who you are and deciding that that's what I'm going to believe, you know, so that identity piece, like those are things that anybody and everybody, regardless of if you have a child with special needs or not, that are helpful for you. Um, and she's like, you know, I needed this for me. I needed this for me. And adversity, I always tell people adversity, I think this is in the book. Adversity is just an opportunity for the greatness in you to come in front, to the front for, forefront. Yeah. You know, it's just an opportunity for that great stuff that you were made of to come into the light, you know, and without that adversity, I think, you know, we don't, we just, we're not stretched. So we don't become stronger. It's just like when you're exercising, you have to stretch that muscle if it's going to get stronger, right? There's no, there's no strength without the stretching, and so all of the stretching that I know I've been through with Kaya and all the challenges that have come along with that, it has just made me stronger. It's, it's made me, I think, have a better hold and a better grasp on this thing called life. And, you know, not to say that I'm always going to feel like on top of things like the way I do now. But I, like I said, she's 14. She's going to be an adult in literally three years three and some change, she's going to be an adult, which is blowing my mind. So ask me in three years how on top of things I feel then. <laughs> so it's just kind of going back to the thing where, you know, no matter, we are going to have some, these, these moments and these times in our lives where we're just going to be especially challenged. And we have to make a decision. What are we going to do to be intentional about having a positive perspective, you know, about those challenges? Totally. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so wanted to ask you what does a health or what what is healthy living for your family done like in regards to Kaya do you see like good and bad days depending on what she eats um, and I mean across the board do you see that within the family what is a healthy lifestyle for you guys in general well I would say the healthy it's all the same for us it's it's well, okay, let me take that back. Um, cause Kaya does not exercise. <laughs> she, there's not really, there's the stretching and, you know, PT and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it started with myself making the decision that I needed to, to, to find the habits that I could incorporate in my life that would be for a lifetime, not just a, some little diet or like I didn't need to diet. I needed to live healthier life. And so, you know, deciding to eat more foods with, you know, more of those clean, healthy foods that I know the nutrition is in, you know, so plants, whatever the case may be, drink more water. I was the worst water drinker ever, you guys. Like, I'm surprised my kids didn't come out looking like raisins. Because it's so <laughs> like, I, I had so much issues drinking water. I always wanted some kind of flavor in it. So I decided I was going to just make sure that I carry a water bottle around. And like, it was always going to go around with me no matter what, you know, if, like I grew a third arm or something, that water bottle was <laughs> always going to go around with me. Um, and so anyway, I just kind of started putting in some of those things, making sure I got enough rest at night, think kind of learning about sleep and how important sleep is and what's happening in the seventh and eighth hour of rest. It's like mind boggling to me. Yeah. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got to get to bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then it kind of started just because I mom was starting something, you know. I, it, so it kind of started trinkling with the rest of my family. So my boys, who are who are um, they're 13 and 11 now, um, they both are now uh, much more aware about their health um, because we kind of started on this whole food nutrition thing, drinking water, working out, things like that. And then my husband bringing up the rear, <laughs> like he just kind of. <laughs> came along but now he I feel like he eats better than I do he's almost become a self-proclaimed vegan um eating things like tempeh and seitan and I'm like oh my gosh what are you eating <laughs> <laughs> but all these plant-based you know proteins essentially because he's hardly eating any meat anymore and so anyway so we started doing that because we realized we wanted to be alive to take care of Miss Kaya for as long as she has years on this earth mm. and so so that was where it started was just making sure that we were good stewards to this bot to these bodies so that we could possibly be here able able bodied to take care of her you know as long as she might need us to and Kaya herself you know when we had to start her on a G2 because she was not gaining weight she stayed at about 40 pounds for like 2 years straight her, which is very normal with kids who are in wheelchairs, her spine just kind of started, you know, every growth spurt that she had, she'd get a little bit more curved and a little bit more curved and a little bit more curved. So she got to be about, about a 90 degree curvature in her spine. Oh, wow. And the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon was like, you have got to do the rod. It's like a spinal fusion thing where they fuse a metal rod to her spine to get her to be upright right. again. Yeah. Cause that affects that affects her organs, you know, her digestive everything. system, all that stuff, everything. So, um, so once we did that, but we had to get her on a G tube because she was not even, she didn't even have enough weight to go through a surgery of that magnitude. So they're like, she needs to gain at least 10 pounds before we can do this surgery. And so we had to get her on a G tube, but unfortunately what a lot of the nutritions and dietitians and doctors, I don't know what they're doing in Australia, but what they were doing over here was there was, I call it crap in a box or hmm. crap in a can. They were basically giving her this PediaSure stuff that just went through um, and was basically just a whole bunch of isolated, fractionated components, you know, vitamins and, you know, trace minerals or whatever um, with a whole bunch of other chemicals, non-food type of items. Yeah. And acid reflux got started. She started vomiting on a daily basis. Um, it was bad. Mm -hmm. It was bad. And she was constipated so bad. And we finally decided after this, um, as soon as we could, we were going to be looking for a food blend, like a real food based formula. Yeah. yeah. Um, I started trying to like blend things up and I did for a while, but I'm like, once she starts school, that's not going to be feasible, you know, to be blending up food for her three times a day. So, um, so the, we got her on a whole food formula and we got her on a whole food, um, like whole food in a capsule type of, um, concentrate. Basically mm -hmm. we started sending that through her gut and I'm telling you, it was like a 180. So now I feel like she probably eats better than anybody else in the house because she's not eating like a stuff that's full of a whole bunch of gluten or processed foods or anything like that. She literally gets those things that the organic food blend and this, these like 30 different fruits, veggies and berries every day, you know, Amazing. that are going. Into her. And yeah. now she's just like, she's come off of almost all of her meds. She does not vomit anymore. We haven't been to the ER since December of last year. That's and amazing. I mean, it's just like a total of 180. So you guys food, the power of food, it makes a Medicine. huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Oh my mm -hmm. God. That's yeah, amazing. it was a Hippocrates. Hippocrates had he he was on to something, you yeah. know, when he said that. Yeah. So yeah. yeah for sure. So so that healthy living thing, that healthy living piece, like we know, like if, whether you're somebody like my daughter who is in a wheelchair or you're somebody who's able bodied like myself or my husband, like it comes down to choices. It comes yeah. down to what are you willing to do to make the needs um, met that your that your body needs you to make. Um, and it's really, I don't believe that it's rocket science. I think that we know that there's nutrition in food, in certain kinds of food, and that we have to make sure that we're getting the right kind of variety of those kinds of foods on, on a daily basis. Even if it's a, even if it's a little bit of a lot 
of different kinds of foods rather than a lot of a little bit. Does that oh, make sense? I love sense? that. Yeah, it definitely that's does. awesome. <laughs> I think too many people look for supplements and that quick fix, which will never be like, if that's what you're looking for, you're looking in the wrong place. Like you need to get back to just real, real food. Real food just always real wins. Food. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Nothing else is going to take the place of those kinds of foods with all the nutrition in it. So yeah, absolutely. And then just the other, the other parts, I think it's the food, it's the water, it's the rest, food, water, rest. I'm missing one exercise, move, move mm-hmm. your body. Mm-hmm. Those are the core four things that I just really try to help people understand. You focus on those core four things and you're going to see better health. You're going to, you know, see some changes and some benefits in your body. So. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Well, what we might start to do is just uh, wrap up here, Rihanna. So the, what we do have is two questions that we ask all of our guests. And the first one that we want to ask you is, um, what is your biggest drive? Like, What gets you out of bed and makes you do the things you do? What's made you write two books? What's made you become the person you've become? Um, knowing that I have the power to to help someone be inspired to be better. Like I, I am empowered by every day because I know that I can help at least one person Mm -hmm. that day. Like that drives me. And, and I know that there are certain gifts and talents that, you know, have been placed in me by my creator. So it's like, I'm not going to sit on those gifts and talents. Like that's not being a good steward of what's been given to me. Mm. So I'm going to use them. And I think that the more that I use them to give, that's, you know, being generous of myself, of my time, of my gifts, of my whatever it is, I'm being generous. That also helps me to feel more fulfilled in this life. I already know after I'm 41 years old, so I know what it feels like to keep stuff to myself and to just Mm. bottle things in. That does not feel as good as offering these things that I have to offer to people. And I feel better for it. People feel better for it on the receiving end. So I'm in a habit of just knowing that that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up. I'm going to see who who can I help and inspire today, you know. And I'm going to be the best mom I can be. I'm going to be the best wife I can be. And, you know, period. So love it. That's awesome. Love it. Well, so is there anything that scares you? This is the final question. Is there anything that you do have a fear around? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because <laughs> I just told you guys, my girl. So Kaya just started high school this week or last week. She just started wow. high school. And I knew that high school was coming. I mean, she graduated from junior high. I knew the next up was a you know freshman in high school. But I think what happened was that my mind kind of went to this well, that also means that she's going to be an adult. You know, she's going to be a technical adult mm-hmm. in just a few years. If you're if you're entering high school, that's what that also means is that 18 is just around the corner. I that seems like uncharted territory for me because we're going into I don't know how they do it in Australia, but you know, she's not technically a minor anymore at that point. And we have to kind of go through this whole process of being her guardian instead of just, you know, she's my kid, you know, type of deal. And, and there's law involved here in the States where you have to find a lawyer and you have to make sure that, you know, her rights are, you know, taken care of in a different way from being just her parent. But, you know, so all these things that are just like thrown in the mix that I really, I think there's a little bit of fear around it because it's the unknown, yeah. you know, it's the unknown. And I don't, you know, when she graduates from high school, what does that mean for her? Is she, are we going to have her in a day program or is she, you know, I I don't know. Like those are the things that I'm like, that's uncharted territory. And those things kind of freak me out just a little bit. I'm not even going to lie. Um, but like what we've kind of talked about, like the thing that I say, the underlying fact is we'll make the most of it the way that we always have, you know, with every other situation that's come in our lives, we'll ask God for guidance and we'll make the most of it regardless. And that's kind of where I am right now to help me not to be too like crazy about it. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) That's a good place to be. (laughs) And so thank you so much for joining us. This has been really good, really insightful little conversation. I've I've had a lot of fun, but people can find you at Rihanna Sanford.com. Where else are your, like your best handles and things like that for people to see? Um, This special life on Instagram. Mm-hmm. That's the name of the book, This Special Life. So This Special Life on Instagram or just Rihanna Sanford on Facebook. Yeah. And those are pretty much the places that I hang out. And so. what about where, where can people get the books from? 
They can get them on my website, rihannasanford.com. So R-H-I-A-N-N-A Sanford.com. Um, and if you want to go straight to the books, you can go slash books. Yeah, awesome. so we'll, we'll attach the links in the yeah, show we'll notes for the listeners. Everything. Beautiful. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. And yes, I look thank you for to having the me. Books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And I know you guys have a whole day ahead of you and I've got maybe just a few more hours before I'm hitting the bed. So thank you for making the time change work out for us to, to do this today. Absolutely. Thank you.